March is Women's History Month, a time to reflect on and celebrate the contributions of women in history and in contemporary society. This year's national theme, Weaving the Stories of Women's Lives, encourages us to explore how women's stories as individuals and collectively are woven into the fabric of our nation's history <coughs> and our present. San Antonio is fortunate to be home to quite a number of women whose contributions and stories are part of our community, part of our history, and part of our culture. We are, we are honored to have the opportunity to engage a few of those women this evening and to have them tell us their stories. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our program moderator, Ms. Eileen Pace. Um, Eileen has been a news reporter with Texas Public Radio since 2010. She has covered a broad range of general assignment stories, investigative reports, and features, and was WAI's first female news anchor, joining Bob Guthrie during Morning Drive for more than a decade. She's a veteran radio and print journalist with a long history of awards for outstanding anchoring, investigative reporting, fe feature reporting, and sports reporting. We are truly honored to have her with us again because she did it last year, and I'm glad uh, she's here again with us this year and hopefully next year as well. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you Eileen Price. Thank you, Ramiro. I'm really excited to be here once again for such an important event. The women that are here with us this evening are the pillars of our community, and that's why we're here to celebrate them. They are excellent role models for Women's History Month for women all over San Antonio. And I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to introduce each of our ladies this evening. Our first panelist is political activist Rosie Castro, a native San Antonian Castro graduated from Our Lady of the Lake University. She has a master's degree in environmental management from the University of Texas at San Antonio. She is a Chicana political activist who helped to establish the political party of La Raza Unida and ran for the San Antonio City Council in 1971. She is the former director of the Center for Academic Transitions at Palo Alto College and retired as interim dean of student success. She has taught public administration courses at San Antonio College and graduate courses at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She facilitated the work of the Blue Ribbon Committee that created the Westside Education and Training Center. She is, this is my favorite part, the mother of twin sons. <laughs> Our Congressman Joaquin Castro and United States Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian, and did a brilliant job with raising those boys. Yes. Thank you. And I have all boys, so she's like my idol. <laughs> Our second panelist is Ms. Akiko Fujimoto, Associate Conductor of the San Antonio Symphony. Born in Japan, Fujimoto holds graduate degrees in conducting from the Boston University and the Eastman School of Music. She is currently the Associate Conductor of the Symphony where she conducts over 40 concerts annually. Previously, Fujimoto was the Conducting Associate for the Virginia Symphony. She has also conducted the National Arts Center Orchestra in Canada, as well as the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, and is doing a beautiful job here in San Antonio, and we're so proud to have you. She didn't make me feel bad at all for being a fan of Paca Bell Cannon, like, all the time. <laughs> Our third panelist is Jackie Gorman, Executive Director of, uh, I'm sorry, we're going... That's okay. Switch places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let me go to Dr. Yvonne Katz, so we just kind of go in order. Dr. Katz is Vice Chair of the Alamo College's Board of Trustees. Dr. Yvonne Katz spent 39 years in public education as a teacher, middle school principal, director of accreditation, and associate commissioner at the Texas Education Agency. 
and as superintendent for almost 20 years in the Harlandale ISD, Beaverton School District in Oregon, and Spring Branch ISD in Houston. Earning her bachelor's degree from UT Austin, Dr. Katz graduated from UTSA and received her doctorate from Texas A&M. She was the organizing and first president of the UTSA Alumni Association and was the first distinguished alumna inductee. In 1991, Dr. Katz was selected by the Texas Association of School Boards as one of the top five superintendents in the state. Welcome, and you do so much for us. Now for Jackie, who is so <laughs> wonderful on the east side, doing so many great things for a community that's growing. Our third panelist is Executive Director of SAGE, which is San Antonio for Growth on the East Side. A self-described military brat, Gorman grew up on the Army basis where her father was stationed. After graduating from the University of Michigan, Gorman served in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer. She moved to San Antonio in 1987 when she accepted a position with the Texas Engineering Extension Service a part of the Texas A&M University system. Today, Gorman is Executive Director of San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, and we all call it SAGE, a nonprofit charged with revitalization and economic development in San Antonio. It's such a wonderful community. Thank you for being here. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this very special event, and we have a series of questions so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, Rosie Castro, who or what were the greatest influences along your path? Well, I think first of all, I grew up in a household with two women, my mother and the person that we call my guardian. Uh, my mother was an immigrant. Both of them worked in order to survive, in order to keep the family going. And so I think the fact that you come from a family where the women work, um, you right away believe that that is the role of a woman as well, that you are always going to work. So I think that's, that set for me the example that women work. Um, I was very fortunate in having very good uh, folks to model after. When I went to Our Lady of the Lake, I had an excellent uh, role model in Dr. Margaret Kramer, who was a psychology teacher, young, with two daughters at the time. She did it all. I mean, she was uh, into the bilingual movement and education. She was a, a teacher both at the college level and then in the community, uh, very active in politics, and that's one of the reasons that I got involved. Uh, but I was fortunate to see strong women. I also grew up next to a, a young African-American woman who was in the Air Force. And she and her husband were both uh, really great role models, but she used to take me out to the bases. So in my mind, and what I always saw was that women worked, women were builders and producers in the community, um, and I saw no difference in terms of how a man and a woman uh, should comport themselves in the business world. That's a very special way to be able to experience your childhood. Many women don't don't have that kind of a background to tell about that sort of equality. Does anyone else have a, a comment about that? I'd say, um, in addition to my parents, I had a couple of teachers. And every one of you in the audience can think back that you had a teacher or a coach somewhere along the way that believed in you and gave you a very special message about how you will succeed. We've all had them. And so one of mine was Mrs. Lowe. And Ms. Lowe was about four foot nine inches tall. <laughs> and she was a bundle of dynamite in seventh grade English. And I watched her how she worked with the classroom because there were big old boys in there that were on the football team. And she would just walk right up to them and raise her head and look up at them like this. And she would say, son, don't you talk that way in here. We are not going to accept that. And she didn't raise her voice. She didn't get angry, angry, but she set the tone. And I really noticed that with Mrs. Ms. Lowe. And then I had Dr. Alvera Griffin in high school. <laughs> that was 
uh, I, I grew up in Baytown, Texas with Humble Oil and Refining Company right across from my home on the bay. And we had quite a few high school teachers back in the that had doctorates. And I just thought every high school had teachers with doctorates. Well, come to find out that wasn't true, but in Baytown it was. So Dr. Alvera Griffin was the health teacher. And back then girls could not wear pants to school. That was not until way later on. And so she had us sit in that health class and we could not cross our legs. And she had us learn to sit and cross our ankles. And she always said, the people who sit on the front row will be the A-plus people. And I told a couple of people of that today uh, to come in and sit on the front row. So they, they both were uh, high believers with me and helped me and molded me. And Dr. Griffin was also the supporter of our drum and bugle corps. And I was the president of that corps at the high school in my senior year. First thing she told me, and I have remembered this and shared this all these years. She said, wipe the word I out of your vocabulary and substitute we, because it will take a team to do what you need to get done as president of the Lee Brigadiers. And so it's always been we all along. So remember that, especially our young people here tonight. Those are very wise words. I'm happy to hear that. Um, Ms. Gorman, I'm interested to know if you experienced a similar um, viewpoint from your background in military life, seeing different roles for men and women, or did you see strong women there too? Yes and no. <laughs> um, nothing is, is ever black and white. Yes, I saw many, many strong women. Um, my mom, her friends, um, the women who, who were my Girl Scout leaders, my teachers. So yeah, I saw many, many strong women. But I also saw many women who, while strong, were in that traditional women's role. I mean, when I was growing up, before the 70s, um, on military bases, you know, my mom, my dad was an officer and my mom went to the officer's wives club meeting and she had on her hat and her gloves and you know, it was, it was her behavior was a part of his evaluation. You know, how far he progressed in his career was significantly impacted on how she behaved. So that from that point of view, I did learn about women's traditional roles, but I can also say this, that in our family, excellence was not an option. It was a requirement. If you were not going to do it well, you weren't supposed to do it. And so, and that's everything that, that we did as children or growing up. My parents were very supportive of my brothers and myself, but they always expected us to do our best. That's wonderful. And Akiko, what, what did you bring from uh, your background in other, <coughs> other countries, other cultures? Uh, actually, um, I grew up in a household that was very traditionally uh, Japanese in the, in the way that my father uh, worked outside of the home and my mother worked inside the home. Um, so growing up, um, she was a young mom. She was 25 when she had me and 26 when she had my brother. So we saw a lot of her and not a lot of my dad. He was the guy that was still sleeping when we went to school and that came home after we went to bed uh, on weekdays. And on weekends, we did see him uh, quite a bit. Um, but uh, he wasn't part of our daily lives. He was a weekend dad. Um, and uh, so my mother was a huge influence on both myself and my brother. Um, my brother calls himself Mama's boy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I didn't have that much time alone with her because he came 13 months after I did, but um, <laughs> she had such a strong hold on me. Uh, she not only raised me, but molded me. She was my teacher, boss, coach, uh, everything, uh, and she, if she were born when I was born, she would have 
been working, of course. But at the time when she graduated from college in Japan, girls didn't work unless, or they couldn't get a respectable job unless your, your father had a connection in some big company. Uh, and she worked in some journalism kind of thing for a couple of years, but she got married and that was your cue to quit working. Um, so we be, my brother and I always talk about how she poured all her energy into us, the energy that she would have put into herself. And we sometimes wonder what would she have become if she worked outside her home, but now she actually works part-time helping out a friend's uh, office. Um, but, um, you know, she never, um, she told me that being a mom is a very convenient job. Of course, we know it's the hardest job, but she said it's very convenient because you only have to work with people that you love. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm sh I envy her for that. Um, and uh, I forget how that changes your whole job description. Of course, she worked hard. If you paid a Japanese mom, and some Japanese women are still like my mom, mom you know, stay-at-home moms. If you pay them what you would pay a non-family member to do, uh, you probably couldn't afford them. Uh, the standard that Japanese wives are uh, held up to for their housekeeping and cooking and child-rearing skills are, I mean, I could never match in any one of those three areas, I think. They're pretty high standards. So, um, so it was a very different um, division of labor, but because of that, because we were mama's kids, um, my mom was such a strong influence, and um, now we're good friends. But um, growing up, you know, I, we had our, you know, days when I was a teenager, when I tried to rebel from her um, stronghold. Um, she stepped away the minute I went to college. But uh, until I graduated from high school, she was really, um, I don't want to say controlling, but she was um, she was a perfect mom, and uh, she still is. So I would say she was a great influence. Um, I have had other female role models um, because uh, when I was in college and starting to get interested in conducting as my thesis, graduation thesis, I wrote a paper after having interviewed about eight female conductors that were working already. So I I do remember wanting a role model. Um, but it's the people that are in your lives directly, your friends, your teachers, your family members that are actually male or female. Um, and now my husband, too, who's also a conductor. Um, those are the ones that really had the biggest impact on me. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So our next question is, what characteristics or skills set you apart and enabled you to be so successful? Um, Jackie, let's start with you. And you know, we can be very casual about this if you ladies have thoughts and you want to interject. We could have a discussion, so don't wait for me to ask. Okay. Skills that set me apart. First, there's probably nothing I won't try. You know, I have not met the challenge that I won't attempt. Tenacity. <laughs> Or stupidness, one or the other. <laughs> Depends on which side you're looking at it from. Um, I, I think that's one of the skills. I think the other one is that um, I can tell the story. You know, I can use my words to help people see the vision. So I, I think that's uh, um, another of those skills. And, and I think finally is that I can talk to people across multiple levels. It really doesn't matter who you are or, or, or where you are in your life's journey or how successful or unsuccessful you've been. I can generally have a conversation with you and, and find that common piece. So I, I think that those are the things that have helped make me successful. Well, that's so important in being able to do work in the community, to be able to express those things and to network and, and draw people in. Well, one more thing. I forgot this one. I will always tell you the truth. It may not be pretty. It may not be what you want to hear. But I will absolutely always tell you the truth. Anyone else? I think one of the characteristics for me was uh, always having a belief in myself. And that came from my parents telling me that 
I can do anything I want to do and be anybody I want to be, but I have to do my homework on it. I have to make my decisions based on my homework, which back then would have been data, collecting data to make your decisions. And I can remember uh, going from Baytown into Houston when I was early elementary, probably first or second grade, because we went into Houston every two years to buy my winter coat, and you had to wear it for two years, no matter how much you grew. And so I went to Foley's and just loved this white coat. And my mother is just going, oh my gosh, she's going to be in a mud puddle before we even get out of Foley's. <laughs> and I remember her sitting there and telling me that I really, and why I should not buy the white coat. <laughs> and so then I had to figure out for two years how I was going to wear that white coat and keep it clean. And I remember sneaking it out to my uncle, my mother's brother, who had a cleaning business, a dry cleaning business in Baytown, because I did get it dirty one day. Mm -hmm. And I snuck it out, got it to him, and um, I think I bribed him with a cup of coffee, and, um, and he cleaned it. But I learned from that white coat experience that I had to follow what it was that I finally decided on, and make the best out of it that I could make out of it. And then one of the other things is I learned a long time ago to dream, to dream big, to look at where you want to be through a dream, and then backpedal, back plan those little steps that you have to start at in order to make it happen, and then make it happen for people and for children and for communities. So I watched my parents do that, and I learned from them. You had that as an example. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I grew up in a house that didn't have a lot of money at all. We made my clothes. My mother taught me how to sew when I was in the second grade. She said, I learned how to sew at this time. You're going to learn how to sew at this time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I made all my clothes up until the time I became a superintendent. And so you, you know, you, you learn those, those lessons and you're able to then dream and make those dreams come true and help others make their dreams come true. That's a great gift. Anyone else? Um, one of the things that uh, growing up, you know, I was a latchkey kid and just about any, every label you can think of, sandwich generation, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But as a latchkey kid, one of the, the things that I could not do was go to other people's houses. I had to stay in the house so that nothing happened. And so I wasn't allowed to go to the neighbor's houses, and so I had to learn to get the neighbors to come to my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was actually a very good skill. It is, Because yeah. I had to learn to... Um, you know, cajole people and entice them and uh, figure out games to play and stuff that would be interesting enough for people to come over. As a result, that carried over into school. Uh, I went to a small Catholic high school and there was nothing to do in high school. Um, that we didn't have big dances and all of that. So we decided that we would start a youth club. And so I was the first president of the youth club. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, we would always have to go make presentations in different places. And I got to do the presentations. So for me, organizing, speaking in front of people, I've never had a problem with that, and I think that has served me well. Um, the organizing thing continued. At Our Lady of the Lake, we wanted to start a Young Democratic Club, but you couldn't do that without a Young Republicans. And so we had to organize 10 people yeah. to start the Young Republicans so we could have our young Democrats. <laughs> Fortunately, there were more Democrats. Yeah, there were Republicans. Uh, but we were able to organize both. That, that has been a skill, the organizing, the communication, that I think has really helped me throughout life, both in a personal way with my sons, in always trying to invest in making sure that we were communicating well with each other, one thing I always ask of them is don't lie to me, okay? Whatever you do, that makes me the most angry is when people lie. And we had a good way of communicating with each other. In the organizing part, I think uh, many of you that live in San Antonio, if you've seen uh, what the media says about the Castro campaigns, one of the things 
that I've always been proud of is that we are a grassroots effort. We organize from everyone who wants to be participating in those campaigns and making a difference in public policy. And I think a lot of that comes from the early days of mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. Well, you can sure still see that in the yeah. work that they're doing even nationally. You know, I think I saw Julian in a picture the other day in, mm -hmm. oh, where was he, Nevada? And he was standing in a situation, the picture was a very grassroots kind of situation. You know, this tie loose, and he's out there, you know, getting his hands dirty, rolling up his sleeves. So that's real interesting that that stayed with them. Sure. Anyone else? Um, what skills set you apart? Oh, gosh. You'd have to ask the San Antonio Symphony musicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, obviously my answer is going to be too uh, industry specific, uh, maybe, for the time being, but um, I would say maybe the three things that the musicians always compliment me on is, uh, and these are things that every number two conductor at a professional orchestra has to be able to do, so otherwise I wouldn't have kept the job. But um, uh, you have to be efficient. Um, you have to know how to run rehearsals with limited time, which I have less of than my boss does. Um, and um, people compliment me on my sincerity because they're used to conductors, some conductors being phony. Um, but I honestly don't know how to do you know, anything but be myself. And when you're yourself, even your harshest critics tend to open up um, and start communicating. And they, musicians are some of the most honest people you'll ever meet because they've been working their whole lives on one skill set, their instrument. Uh, and that's how they've been evaluated and that's what gives them pride. Uh, so in that way, they're extremely honest people and to work with 80 honest people, you have to be pretty honest and they can see right through you. Some orchestras say that the minute the conductor starts walking toward a podium, they know if you're real or not as a person, you know, and it's that telling. They can smell phoniness from a far away, you know, <laughs> a mile away. Um, so those two things, um, and uh, what's, what's the third thing? Maybe um, just my ability to talk to anybody. Uh, you know, I have conduct on so many different series, um, from kids to old people to everybody in between, um, from pops to classical. And so, but I think that might come from the fact I moved a lot when I was a kid and changed schools a lot. And then I'm bicultural. Uh, so I had to be, and then within the United States, I've lived in I think at least five different states and multiple cities. And every time you move to a new state, you feel like you move to a new foreign country. <laughs> um, so you know, I think that diversity in background, having to always think in at least two perspectives, uh, has certainly helped me deal with. You know, and people always say, "Why are you so calm under pressure? Why are you so calm when something horrible is going on stage or off stage?" And you know, it's because nothing phases me anymore. <laughs> um, I've been in so many situations, so I guess, yeah, those are a couple of things that I get complimented on. So. Those diverse situations are very teaching, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What challenges have you experienced because of gender, because of your gender? I think we all have stories about that, but which ones are we willing to share? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'll start out. I've, I've worked in a man's world all along. And my father never let me use my gender for any kind of excuse. Uh, it was, look at what you did, what should you have done, what will you do next time, now, how are you going to fix this? And so um, that's, that was one thing just from growing up that he would never let me make an excuse because I was a girl. Um, I was the first woman secondary principal in Northside School District, and back then they didn't think we women could be secondary principals. I know that's news to a lot of you young people here, but they didn't think we could do that as women. And so I had been in a previous position, director of special ed, where I would go out to all the schools, meet with the principals and all. So they all knew me, all the high school principals knew me, all the middle school principals and so on. 
So I remember we were having our back to school orientation meeting with the superintendent. And we had to go and pick up the teacher's plan books and boxes and the teacher's grade books and boxes and all to take them out to the school. And so I was kind of humming and hawing around where, they, where the boxes were sitting. And one of the high school principals turned to me and said, well, now that you're a principal, a secondary principal, you can pick up your own damn boxes, cats. Hmm. And I said, well, okay. Having worked at the central office for four years, I went and got our custodian. We got the hand truck, came and loaded up the boxes. I helped him load them up. We passed all the principals going out with the, the loaded truck uh, thing uh, full of boxes. And I said, thank you so much for reminding me that I am now a secondary principal. So you have to kind of throw it back. And you had to back then because you had to you had to create your position when you went into these new positions. And I have shattered a lot of glass ceilings along the way. I mean, it's just that's the way my life is gone. So I looked like a woman, but thought like a man all the way. And that was before Steve Harvey wrote that book. <laughs> because I worked with men. I went and played when we were at meetings. We'd go play golf. We'd go, you know, after the meeting and have a little hot toddy or something. So I got really into how they thought and how they worked and all. Fortunately, Title IX came along in the mid to late 70s, late 70s. Uh, Title IX is 42 years old this, this year. And that helped open up some opportunities for our women. But without Title IX, uh, we didn't have the opportunities that our younger women have now. So um, working with men and being with men in meetings and all as a superintendent, I dressed as a superintendent just as you're seeing me today. I always have. And so I've always had to help the men in the committee meeting or the audience or my presentation get through the curly hair, the curly eyelashes, all the flashy jewelry, all of the clothes. And it, gives, it takes about two minutes for them to do that. And then we get down to talking turkey. And men have to see that we women know our stuff, that we have done our homework, we know our data, we know how to deliver it, and that we don't personalize what their comments might be to us. And if there's one message I can give to you younger women tonight, it's don't personalize some of the comments that you might get. Let them roll off your back. Remember the story, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Let that play in your mind when you're in that situation. Fortunately now, uh, women are in all parts of our country at all levels and all key leadership positions. Um, I'm chair of the Women's Chamber of Commerce. It started in 1988 because back then the Greater Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, and the North Chamber that was just getting started didn't believe that women could even be committee chairs, much less chairs of those chambers. And of course, history has proven that wrong. We've had women chairs in all of those chambers now. So uh, I, I have experienced uh, being in a man's world, and I've just given it right back to him, and it's been so much fun. Um, let me say that, you know, Truly, the, many things have gotten better since I was a young person and, and in the workforce, but there's still so much that has to be done when it comes to women, uh, women's rights. Uh, and just for example, in, in the United States of America, we've never seen a woman president. Why is that? We may there's, next time. Still, <laughs> we will, I hope, see one soon, but there truly still is a mindset that thinks that women are not of the highest caliber of leadership. 
I believe that still exists. You can look at all the data and see that, yes, there are women in the top 500, but they're very few. Mm -hmm corporations. Right. Uh, you can look at foundations anywhere else you want and we're still not reaching those heights for no other reason other than that we're women. Not because we're not prepared, not because we haven't gone to Stanford or Harvard or these kinds of schools, but because we are women. And I think where you see that the most is now that you see the continuing fight towards minimum wage, equal pay, Daycare and daycare, you know, abilities to have adequate childcare is not just a woman's issue. It's a man and a woman's issue, but it persists as a woman's issue. I mean, so I think just like with Latinos, you know, we've reached many heights, but there's still so much work to be done. Even today in the workplace, if you get a sexual harassment situation, a male and a female, what I've always seen working in personnel is that the woman will be sent away, banished somewhere, and the guy will be allowed to keep his job. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, nine out of 10 cases that I've seen, that has been what happens. So there's still an injustice, and I've seen every form of them, I think. My biggest disappointment when I was at the city of San Antonio, I had hoped to, my goal was to be a, a personnel director, human resource director. That didn't happen, but I watched another man who had been kicked out of his job actually get back put in that job even though I was up for that job as well. So, you know, I kind of gave up the dream of uh, personnel and went on to other things. But too often in the workplace, the bias is of, oh, she's going to leave the workplace because she's going to have a baby. She's not going to be around long enough. Um, she doesn't take this seriously as another man would take it. All of that still is there. And it was interesting because when I was uh, at the center, I, I, I was in, in, encountered a problem with a woman who went off on maternity leave. And you know, my first thing to instinct was say, oh God, how am I gonna do this when she's gone and what are we gonna do? And I had to stop and think of my, to myself, okay, this is what people do. They put women down because they stop working for a little while. At any rate, that's all to say, I have encountered just about every not being listened to uh, in debate and discussion because you're a woman, uh, not being equally paid as men were. Mm -hmm. So your job, those of you that are just in the workplace now, will be to continue to equalize that. When I was at the, the city personnel department in the 80s, I remember reading statistics about women's pay, and at that point, only 2% of women made $50,000 a year, 2%. And of course, I thought, well, I've got to reach 50,000, you know? Yeah. But now, if you look at those statistics, how many women make 100,000 a year? And you know, yeah, I know, that's just money, but it still tells you a lot about the inequities that exist within uh, the workplace, unfortunately. For sure. yeah. But we're going to get there. There's, there's no, the thing is that Ginny was let out of the bottle many years ago, and we just make that progress slowly but surely. We march towards that progress, and that progress really liberates not only women and our children, but the men as well. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you have some ideas about specific things that women can do in their own positions to make those incremental steps, young, especially young women. Well, I think Yvonne spoke to, you know, not to take things personally. That's a very hard thing mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. because my instinct is, oh, what did you say? Yeah. You, know, <laughs> um, you want to say that again? Um, but but there, there are ways to learn how to uh, get along in a setting, not by just keeping your mouth shut, but by being able to get people to understand what it is or how it is that they are reacting negatively towards women. I think right now there's a lot of legislation that is specifically would help women. We gotta get behind that legislation. Mm -hmm. Some of it doesn't look like it's ever gonna pass, but it will one day. You know, I come from a time when, and in politics, it didn't look like we would ever have the opportunity to have the mayor, 
uh, to have a governor, to have a president. All of that has changed. So I think that, one, you have to look at, you know, what are the social injustice that is still exists in the workplace, and then how is it that you can work towards uh, justice, both in the workplace and outside in legislative types of ways? You know, you ask about uh, how do you take those incremental steps, <clears throat> and I'll give you a story, because stories are very strong, and they help us uh, maybe reflect back on them when we're faced with the situation. I told you I was with Northside School District, and I was special education director. And Clark High School was getting ready to open. And I had determined already that I wanted to become a school principal, and different ones knew that. So I filled out an application. Now, I, I had had one year of teaching in an experimental school with middle school age youngsters who had difficulties, behavioral difficulties and academic ones. That was my experience at the secondary level. So I filled out an application, marched right in, handed it in to the superintendent secretary and said, I'm applying for Clark High School for the principal. And she nearly fell out of her chair. <laughs> And so they went on and on through the process and all, and the day they were going to take it to the board, they decided, uh-oh, we better get Katz down here and talk to her, because I was probably the only woman who'd put in an application. And so um, they called me in, and I talked to Mr. Cody and Mr. Jordan. Now, that was my seed planting time. And I, I am a huge believer in planting seeds. You have to plant the seeds before you harvest the crops. And we have to spend time planting the seeds <laughs> and watering them and fertilizing them. So that was my seed planting session. The next year, I was named the first woman secondary principal in Northside. So you see, you plant that seed, you work on it, you go and talk with the superintendent, you talk with the deputy superintendent, you fertilize, you keep watering, you keep doing those things. It's those little bitty steps that you have to take before you get there. So that's, that's a story that shows you there's a seed planting time to do that. Yeah, and I think what it is is that you have to dare. You have to dare. You, you have know, to step that's, out. That's what you have to see women do. Right. Uh, right now, the, there's not many women that run for office. Mm -hmm. We have to dare. You have to dare to say, mm -hmm. I'm good, I can do this, mm -hmm. and do it. Make that application. Right. Don't hold back. Don't be afraid. Guys aren't afraid. The guys don't hold back. Sometimes <laughs> they're the biggest louses, and they still apply. <laughs> so we know that you need to be prepared, but you got to dare. But and you that's know, actually, really though, my ahead. career yeah. has been spent, a good chunk of it, in non-traditional fields mm -hmm. for women. Um, I started off in the military. And, you know, a, a, as a young officer, um, my contemporaries were in those first one or two classes where they let women into West Point. And so, you know, a lot of folks were not used to seeing young, off young female officers and certainly not interacting with young female officers. And I was an intelligence officer and there were quite a few women in my unit. And, and, and as a battalion staff officer, I remember being in the field one time and I was the S2 intelligence officer, and we looked around. The S3 was a woman. The, the, S, the S3 was operations. The S4 was a woman. That was supply. The S1 was a woman. That was personnel. But the commander was a, was a colonel. We're in the field. We, and it was at Fort Hood. You spent weeks in the field there. But we were in the field, and, and this tank colonel walks into to our um, operations center, and he looks around, and he says, well, dang, Colonel, you got a battalion of Amazons up in here. <laughs> you know, because it was all women. It was all women. Um, but I've also had some situations in the construction industry, particularly, where I was not only the only woman, but I was the only black person. Mm. And, you know, that's a whole new, different dynamic to mm -hmm. that. And I remember in Louisiana one time I was building for um, 
a production home builder and I'm in my construction trailer and my contractors are going in and out and we're signing contracts and people are getting paid. And this guy walks in and looks at me and he says, I don't talk to the maid. Oh, I'm looking no. around and um, I'm like, well, you know, I don't know where the maid is, but if you think you're going to get paid today, you can talk to me. You know? And sometimes you've got to just give it right back at them. I cannot tell you how many times I've been called the B word. My usual response to that is, thank you so much, because you know they pay me extra for that. <laughs> you know? you, you extra can, set of skills. You can never. <laughs> the thing that I would tell young women, though, never use your gender as an excuse or as a tool. Mm. You know, you right. see women use their gender as a tool, and it will get you so far. Mm -hmm. But then you'll realize that that tool is not as valuable anymore and it's cost you some credibility. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the advice that I would give them. Your gender is neither an excuse or a tool. Mm -hmm. It is who you are. But do your job and, and, and do your job well and be confident mm -hmm. that you can right. do your job well. And then don't, don't take anything from anybody. Give it back to them. Don't own go. other people's foolishness. Mm -hmm. Such mm -hmm. wisdom. Yep. Well, did thoughts about having to balance work and family ever um, influence the things that you did in your career, the path you took, or um, change things for you? Not me. That's why I have a cat. <laughs> 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 so I, I don't think that I made a conscious choice, but I do think that some of my career choices that have have led to the fact that my family is a cat. Anyone else? I think for me it was difficult. Uh, the thing that was a saving grace is that uh, having the twins, I had my mother living with me. Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. really, uh, I, you know, I, when I was in personnel, I did a lot of work around daycare for uh, women and their children because I recognized that if I had not had her, I would have had a lot more guilt I had guilt as it was already. Mm -hmm. um, the other day I was having this talk with my, my daughter-in-law, who has uh, Joaquin's wife, who has one uh, daughter, who was about 15 months old. And she was saying, you know, but if I'm not here, and I've, uh, when I go off to work, I just feel guilty leaving her by herself. Mm -hmm. You know, although she's got someone that takes care of her. Um, I think that's still very hard for women. That, that's a very delicate balance, uh, but a couple of things have to happen. We have to get away from the idea that women are the primary mm -hmm. child caretakers. Mm -hmm. It should be a dual thing. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can get men to understand that, I think the better it is. Um, I think that continues to be a hard thing and that we have to provide child care uh, for women and men so that they can continue in their careers and feel that the kids are they're secure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of why you have pre-KSA, mm -hmm. uh, both for the learning and growth of the child, but also to give parents a chance to know that their children is, are in a secure place. For me, it was hard, but it, you know, I was fortunate that I could do a lot because of my mother's fault. Akiko, have, have you experienced changes in your career path because of your gender and made decisions uh, um, that would be different? I wish I could say that, but I can only blame myself and lack of talent <laughs> or work um, for my lack of success. Uh, but I do say, you know, that, and of course I chose to marry a conductor, so he works out of state and we've never lived in the same place. and. You know, so it's hard to have a family when the mom and dad live in two different states. Um, so that hasn't been a possibility for us. Um, and um, I think the biggest thing for me uh, is the pressure of the perfect mom that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, and I will never be able to replicate what she gave me and my brother. Uh, because um, when I'm conducting, um, or studying to conduct, um, I can't afford to be worried about somebody else because I'm so worried about me and my work output. And I want to excel and I want to serve the music and musicians and 
I cannot imagine splitting my brain and my heart into two such important things. So I might be one of those all or nothing people. Um, maybe one day I'm just going to say, oh, you know, I've conducted enough or something. I'm going to be a full-time mom. I, I just, right now, you know, because of practical things like childcare and my husband being away, I cannot, and my own selfish, you know, in wanting to be a great conductor and still pursuing that, I think. But see, this is the guilt thing that if yeah. I had to choose between studying or preparing and then saving a crying baby in another room, I just don't know. Of course, I'd run to the baby, I guess, but <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can't even guarantee you that. And, <laughs> I'm the person who kills plants that people give me saying, you can't kill this plant. And I have killed them. Um, and I don't even have a cat, so um, I'm not even at that level. Um, so conductors are selfish people, and I am one of them. We just need to hoard time. We just need alone time, a lot of alone me time. Um, we may not be focused all the time, but we just need to be by ourselves. Uh, and. People always say, oh, it must be so hard being away from your husband all the time. But honestly, if he's here, here for more than 10 days, it can kind of gets hard. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I start being worried about my stuff. And it's like, oh, my God, I haven't studied. And, you know, I almost need him to leave so that I have nothing else to do <laughs> but work. Yeah. Um, and I know it sounds very extreme, um, but, you know, fortunately, he he's more laid back than I am. Uh, but, um, you know, he just, um, and I can't quit him because he's my number one um, advisor and, you know, my de facto cheerleader and my number one understander. So I can't quit him. Um, so, you know, <laughs> some, something has to give, but uh, I have not, I, I may never figure out this balance. I may never be able to balance. I might have to choose one over the other. Uh, and it's kind of getting too late for me to make uh, <laughs> the other choice, but uh, I don't know, who knows? Ask me in a year and, you know, I might have squeezed in something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, I, I, I don't think I can balance. I'll start with a plant and then a cat and then <laughs> maybe family. So. That's very good. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Dr. Katz, did you want to address that? Any changes that you I would like to just say that uh, my daughter has four children. And uh, we had a conversation after the first two. And I said, you know, two is really a good number. <laughs> and, um, and so they decided to have two more. And um, so when we talk over the phone, they're in Denver. When we talk over the phone and she is complaining about the balance piece and oh mom we're having to go to soccer here and football there and bip 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 oh do you remember that conversation we had in Guam <laughs> I uh, I know that everyone has to find what balance means for them and balance for me might be very different as balance for you. And that goes back to your organization piece. You have to be extremely organized. How do you get your, yourself together? How do you get your, your husband together, if you have a husband to help out? How do, how do you create that plan for balance? And you have to have a plan. Uh, you have to have a plan. And in this day and time, um, I think all of us are really working to have a good set of friends uh, that can be family, as well as our friends from work, as well as friends there on either side of where we live. And so you have to kind of lay everybody out and figure out, now where do you fit into my plan for balance and for helping? And then implement your plan. So I'm a country western dancer. And, you know, country western dancing, you dance around the dance floor, around and around the backwards. dance floor. Backwards. <laughs> backwards. And in heels, <laughs> as Ann Richards said. And you just really hate it when some couple stops in the middle of that going around piece, and you've got to figure out how you get around them. 
So you never stop in the middle of the dance floor. You never get pushed in a corner on your life's dance floor. You're always out in the middle of that dance floor going around and figuring out how you get around this couple that stopped. That's your plan B. So you always are having to look at how do I plan? How do I monitor my plan right now? How do I monitor and adjust my plan right now? And who are the people that I need to talk about helping me with my plan? So to me, that's how people look at creating the balance in their lives. What a great analogy. I'll never forget that. <laughs> Good. Um, then the evening has been worth it. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> How important is it for you to share stories of women's lives with the next generation? Um, Jackie? You know, there is not one way to be a woman. We all have to find the way that we will be our woman. In the way that you do that, it's almost like a tapestry. You know, you pick something from this great woman that you've learned, you take this from your mom, you get this from your auntie, you know, this from your abuela over here, or your friend's abuela over here, taught me how to make tortillas. You know, you take all of those pieces that you learned from other women, all of those shared experiences, and you weave them together, and that becomes the fabric of your womanliness. And so that's why it is so important that we share our stories and we find our commonality. We find those places where we can support each other. And we find those places where we can respectfully disagree with each other. But we take those pieces and they become part of your whole. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We all do learn things mm -hmm. from everybody that we meet. And growing up, it may be your friend's abuela, mm -hmm. right? We have, uh, with the Women's Chamber of Commerce, we have uh, four educational programs. We have shifted from the 1980s of having to have an organization to have a woman's voice out there, because now the other chambers and other organizations have women's voices. So we've shifted a bit, and we are providing education. One of the ed four education programs is called the Power Hour, luncheon and we have three of those a year and we ask our power women from san antonio who have literally undergirded and built this city some of them by hand literally built our city to come and share their story and their story is they have to follow the same outline your career pathway what you've done where you've been where you're going your vision, what, what is your vision? What are your goals that surround that vision? What kinds of resources did you pull together to help implement your vision and your goals? And then what have been the personal and professional obstacles along the way and how did you deal with them? And one of our sessions, there wasn't a dry eye in the luncheon place, including Dr. Maria Ferrier, who was our speaker. So it's those stories that we share with each other, and we can take a piece here and a piece there, and you're taking the dance floor tonight, and someone else is taking the twins being raised, and someone else is taking what has been said here. So it's those stories that help us reflect back when we hit that particular instance in our life. And we can think back and it helps us. And remember. And remember. Mm -hmm. Akiko or Rosie? Well, one of the things that, um, you know, I like to look at a global view of things. If you look at films right now and throughout the ages, it has not been women's stories that are shown in the films, for the most part. <coughs> if you look at biographies and you know the whole literature, it has not been women's stories that are uppermost in, on stage. Um, I think we still need to tell our stories. 
that we're still at that phase, and certainly for Latinas, where we need to see our folks writing about women's stories, uh, because there's not enough of that out there. It's important to share a story. It can be inspirational. People often say, because I was a single parent, um, they'll say, you know, it helped me to know that you could raise these two guys being a single parent. Uh, they may not know that I had a great mother that helped, you know, but they say, you know, I, I know that maybe that gives me some hope that I can do that too. Or people talk to entrepreneurs that couldn't get that first loan because they were a woman. Mm -hmm. And when I'm growing up, your husband had to co-sign right. stuff. Right, until the so, 60s, right? you know, right? lots of things that when people tell their stories, you figure out what insurmountable odds they surmounted. Um, and I think there's a lot of very inspirational stories out there. When I look at the city of San Antonio, you know, I went to Catholic school for 12 years and then another four at the lake. Uh, I dealt a lot with Catholic nuns and they have always been a source of inspiration for me. But big institutions, Santa Rosa Hospital, Incarnate Word, Our Lady of the Lake, those, all, those institutions came about because, for example, in the case of Incarnate Word in Santa Rosa, there was an outbreak, a disease here, and three nuns came in a horse and carriage wagon all the way to San Antonio and started a hospital that we didn't have. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. But what do we hear? We don't hear the story of the three nuns. Nobody even knows their name. We hear all these other stories. And it's a shame that we lose our own history, our own culture, our own city builders. And I think it behooves us to make sure that the names of Emma Tenayuka and so many others uh, are preserved so that if people didn't know them, they'll see them somewhere and say, well, who was she and what did she do? We really need to work towards that because there's so much talent here that our women, that we're partners in building this city in building this state and this nation, um, that they're still lost. And uh, I'm glad that the library is doing this kind of project. Uh, we're looking forward to doing something with Institute of Texas Culture too. But I hope that all of you, you know, will go back and make sure you're pushing forward the stories of women. I find that, you know, starting with my generation, by the time we entered workforce, we were very lucky. It wasn't legal anymore to discriminate, you know. So we don't have as good of stories that are like outright sexist. <laughs> um, so we're very lucky in that. But I think uh, if there's any more gender discrimination or bias, it's uh, very subtle things that you can't put your finger on. And we can't, it's hard to call people out on those things. Um, but I think uh, it is, we always uh, gravitate toward role, finding role models because if you don't see enough of your type doing something that you want to do, you wonder if it's even a possibility. So then you s say, well, you're like me, but you're older. How did you, did you do it and how did you do it? And it was, po obviously you succeeded. So, you know, and that's how I started too when I wrote that paper in college. Um, but I find that it's challenging, more and more challenging to call people <coughs> out on things um, because you know, we don't leave footprints anymore, legal footprints anymore. Um, and uh, I think the next challenge is to figure out what are those subtle, intangible things that still might go on in workplace um, while we still tackle the, still the obvious things, um, um, you know, that our society has. Um, but I do think, in, at least in my industry, there are a lot of women conducting now and, you know, uh, until you've conducted uh, the orchestra that's almost as good as the New York Philharmonic, you're not going to be asked to conduct the New York Philharmonic. So until women get to conduct that level just below the New York Philharmonic, they will not be asked to be the music director of New York Philharmonic. You know? So this is, um, it's not a pecking order, it's just there's an order to the universe and that you need to prove yourself at the immediate level below or at the same level, at a peer institution, to enter that. And it's men or women, it doesn't matter. Um, so until women, 
there are enough women to choose from at that level just below, you may not see that. But uh, in my industry, I believe it's going to happen. It might not be during my career span, but it might be. I think there are so many um, younger women entering the field. So, uh, but we just have to wait for things to slowly rise to the top so that they can take from a bigger pool. Because if you're the only woman and you're not the best, you don't want to be picked either. So. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for doing this. Um, I think it's time that we open the floor up to some questions. I'll, I'll get out of the way so I won't be with my back to you. Um, maybe some questions from the audience would be a good idea right now. Does anyone have any question for our, our guest? Yes, ma'am. Stuff you didn't know what the next career move was going to be. How did you overcome that? I don't know if it was just something that clicked, that felt, you know, this is where I want to do next, or is it, was it just kind of, I've got a day to day kind of thing, we're saying little steps uh, to get to the position that you were in today? Well, I'm not like Dr. Katz. I'm not the career planner. Um, you know, things just kind of happen, and I take advantage of them. But I, I would say that if your life, your entire life, not, your, not just your work life, if your life reflects the things that you are passionate about, then those things will find you. you know, so for me, I am passionate about service. And so whenever I was at a transition point, there were always opportunities for more service. So I think that if you are true to yourself and, and, and surround yourself with the things that you really love, you'll find, you'll find your way or your way will find you. Yeah, and I'd say that uh, you have to prepare yourself for life, you know, for whatever it is, the goal that you want to reach. You need to be preparing for that. But you have to be ready for serendipity to happen. You have to know that sometimes you're going towards this goal, you think, and another opportunity comes in the way that might take you in, in a different direction, but to better places. Um, for me, you know, I studied to be an urban planner, and I, was, I really enjoyed the coursework, but we had to do an internship with the city of San Antonio, and I interned with, uh, or I went to interview with the, the personnel department, and I fell in love, and I took that track. A few years later, I said earlier, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So I had an opportunity to go to Haku because education was a passion. That led me to many other things. I've been in public service. I've stayed in public service for the most part. But I've never been one to say, okay, I'm only going to, my sons are probably closer to, I'm only going to do this. Um, I tend to say, okay, life has a way of taking twists and turns. I've got to be open. And... That's the way I think you're able to, you know, get ultimately to where you want to go. When I was um, in my, in, oh, I don't know what that to is. do with that. <laughs> it's a cricket, <laughs> giant cricket. I have, I have my timer with me, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh my gosh, my timer is going off. <laughs> <laughs> when I was um, in my last teaching position. I loved teaching, absolutely adored teaching, had lots of fun with it. But I also knew after sitting in the teacher's lounge year after year after year, hearing all of us gripe about the principal, that I said, you know, if I could become a principal, I could really help do things around a school. So I went to UTSA, enrolled in the, their first opening class, and uh, became a principal. And then when I sat with all the principals in the principals meetings and heard them gripe about the superintendent, <laughs> I said, you know, if I became a superintendent, I could really do lots of things. So I started planting seeds. But what I want to get back to is not only my seed planting story, but also you may not know what could open up where you are currently employed. 
So volunteer for special projects in your company. Volunteer for special committees in your company. Because then the people, and there are higher ups, that will be seeing you in a new light and will be seeing how you work with other people and what your skill sets are. And then, uh, like Rosie said, you know, it might be a serendipitous kind of thing that happens. You might be planning to go this way, but someone comes in from the company and says, we've been noticing what you've been doing the last year on this special project. And we want to talk about uh, talk to you about it, and it, and it, okay? So look at that. Those are some of those small steps that will help you make a decision about staying with your company and perhaps going higher or looking at what are some other things that I might be able to do. Be surprised when those opportunities just pop up. Yes, sir. I do. I have a question. So um, one of the things I've noticed over time is that in general when uh, another or a minority, um, for example, women, have an issue uh, integrating into institutionalized spaces, um, many times the solution has been to just assimilate to the male, white, Western European dialect, dress, and way of being. And I often wonder, you know, as women that have come up through this, being, you know, this space, you know, how have you navigated being able to keep who you are and understand that space and change that space? Um, I would, that, that's that's something I've always wondered because I kind of face that myself, uh, being a Latino. But I know from a woman's perspective, it has a whole other set of issues that are in the Well, know, you want to hear it? I have always <laughs> done some unusual things, <laughs> but I have always been a girly girl. Mm -hmm. And if you go into my grandmother's house, you think we're from right the same now, family, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you go into my grandmother's house in Detroit right now, there is a picture on her wall. It's a framed cover of the Parade Magazine from the, the Detroit News when I was an undergraduate at University of Michigan. I was in ROTC. And I remember this weekend because I had stayed out way too late the night before and had to be in my ROTC stuff at like six o'clock in the morning and I kind of changed clothes in my car and you know we went off and my grandmother calls me the next week and she says you're on the cover of this magazine and I'm like really grandma and she said yeah and I said well, what's it about and she's like the, the, the thing says the new army and so there is a picture of me with makeup on <laughs> long red fingernails <laughs> holding an M16. <laughs> and so That's what I right. can say to you is you don't assimilate, you be you. Mm -hmm. And as right. long as you're good at what you yeah. do. That's the key. You is okay. Right. Yeah. So I've done braids, you know, I wear bright mm -hmm. colors. I, <laughs> doesn't matter, you know. I'm me. Take me or don't. It is. Yeah, that, that is so true to be you. And I've, I, because I've had women come up and ask me, well, how do you wear that stuff? I could never do that. I could never wear that necklace. And I go, sure you can. You just get you a necklace, put it on, get in front of the mirror and throw that chest out and say, <laughs> I can do this. You have to practice sometimes. Standing in front of the mirror and saying, I can do this. I can do that. That's that confidence in yourself that you have to have. And then if you need to look at making some changes, you know, you have to take little small step changes in the workplace, you start talking about it. And again, planting seeds when you're having little meetings about could we do this on this Friday? Could we do this once a month? What do y'all think about doing da 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 da? See, and start planting the seeds. And then somebody will come to you within the week and say, yeah, that was a good idea. I think we ought to talk about that more. And so then you start getting wheels on it and the flywheel starts to really roll. And then you start to look at making some changes. But don't be afraid to be you. But when you're you, when I was like this in Oregon, where the, the brightest colors were navy blue with black, <laughs> 
and little bitty earrings that were gold. Now, I'm not saying anything against that, but that's Oregon. And I walk in like this, oh my gosh. That was a culture awakening for those Oregonians. <laughs> and the earrings did get longer at the central office. They did, over the years. But be you, be excellent at what you do, and be a leader. There's a leader in every chair in here. Every chair has a leader in it. So be that leader. So we got our seeds. We got be yourself. Mm -hmm. We got serendipity and we got the plants go last. <laughs> we can kill the plants, it's okay, because we have things to do. Um, I don't know, this is one of those evenings that I wish could just go on and on and on, and I've really enjoyed it, and I have about a thousand more questions, but we <laughs> want to respect your time, and so, ladies, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and <laughs> it's been my pleasure to be here, you know, for Women's History Month. I'm so uh, excited that you guys asked me back again. Ramiro, you have some closing Thank you, panel, again, for sharing your wonderful stories. Thank you for being inspirational, not only to, to the women here, but speaking for the other gender, for men as well. Uh, I was inspired by your stories, the challenges, and, uh, but I'm most proud of how you overcome those challenges and have achieved success. Again, thank you for being so inspirational and for being such wonderful role models. Um, Eileen, I also want to thank you for again participating in this program and I hope uh, you will join us again next year. Thank you for doing such a wonderful job. On behalf of the San Antonio Public Library, I would like to present each of you with a token of, a, of our appreciation. Here to present uh, your gifts are teens from the IGO Branch Teen Library Council who, who represent the future generation of San Antonio leaders. The teens have been assisting with staff and working with staff to put this program together. And uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and they will be presenting their gifts. Thank you very much. What is your name? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's heavy. I also want to thank our audience and those who are watching the live streaming. Uh, thank you for participating and for listening and tuning in to this program. Uh, we hope you take a few moments to provide some feedback about tonight's event by scanning the QR code located on the back of your program. Uh, your feedback is extremely important to us so that we can do better next time. Um, in closing, I would like to invite you all to a reception just outside the doors. I hope you stay and join us in some refreshments. Thank you again so much. <laughs>